It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I, sorry I can't actually be present, uh, but I appreciate this opportunity to, to talk to you about uh, some of the issues that uh, you will be discussing uh, tomorrow. Uh, let me begin uh, by the observation, which should be obvious, that uh, the North Atlantic, uh, the United States and Europe, are not in good uh, economic shape. Uh, it's been uh, six, seven years since uh, uh, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, since the breaking of the bubble. And I don't think anybody would say that uh, either Europe or America are back uh, to robust recovery. What I want to do in these uh, few minutes is uh, spend a, uh, just a little time describing, in my judgment, how bad things are, then talk a little bit about uh, my analysis of, of the underlying problem, and then a few words about uh, how to uh, return our economies to robust growth. The, if we look at the, the uh, uh, North Atlantic, uh, the United States is obviously in better sh shape uh, than Europe. Um, but still, in the United States, growth remains anemic, barely fast enough to create jobs for the new entrants in the labor force. Uh, the official unemployment rate uh, uh, hides the large amount of disguised unemployment. Uh, the weak labor market is reflected in the low participation rate, uh, the weak wages, uh, the fact that 95% of the gangs since 2009 have gone to the top 1%. Uh, data that just came out uh, a short while ago showing that median income remains below the level uh, 25 years ago. The median income of a full-time male worker lower than four decades ago. Uh, the labor force participation rate, the lowest since 1978. Uh, these are uh, all in spite of some uh, notable successes in the United States, the low price of gas, um, the uh, strong sectors like uh, uh, the high-tech sectors, but uh, there remain important weaknesses. For instance, uh, the job-creating sector, the SMEs, are still constrained, partially because of constrained lending, which is still markedly below what it was before the, the crisis. Most significantly, if you look at the trend line of where the U.S. was going before the crisis and where we are today, what you see is that we are some, uh, uh, the, the, the cumulative loss is, is uh, some 15% of our GDP, uh, trillions of dollars. And uh, the gap uh, is growing, though only uh, mildly so as growth uh, is beginning to be restored. The only thing that makes America feel good is that things could be worse, and when we look at the other side of the Atlantic, we see that things are worse. Uh, a few, uh, not long ago, Europe was celebrating the end of a double-dip recession. The fact that this was occasion of a celebration uh, was testimony to how uh, aspirations have been lowered. Uh, but in fact, now Europe faces the threat of a triple dip recession. Uh, if we look at the indicators, who, we see all of them dismal. GDP in many countries below the 2008 level. Spain and Greece are in depression with more than 50% youth unemployment. Uh, the uh, even the best performing countries, like Germany, have grown at an average rate that in any other circumstance would be called dismal. Uh, significant fractions of the population in Germany have a lower income than 15 years ago. And then if we look at uh, the comparison between where Europe would have been uh, if we extend the trend line through 2008 and where we are today, it is far worse than the United States and the gap is growing even more rapidly. Uh, 
Let me move on to my diagnosis of where things have gone wrong. Uh, it's a combination of problems. Uh, the, the basic underlying problem is uh, that of um, lack of global aggregate demand. Uh, there are many factors contributing to this lack of global aggregate demand. Uh, five that I would, uh, six that I would, would uh, uh, emphasize. The first is global imbalances, a fundamental asymmetry. Countries that have a surplus uh, don't necessarily have to expand their consumption, their demand, while countries that with large deficits have to constrain their demand. Uh, the growing inequality, uh, similar kinds of uh, asymmetry. Uh, those with the low income and have the incomes going down have to constrain their consumption. Those at the very top don't expand uh, their consumption. And uh, the crisis has increased inequality a vicious downward circle. There's a need for structural transformation, uh, not only to respond to the challenges of globalization, the fact that there is a change in comparative advantage, but also to the fact that there has to be a move from manufacturing to the service sector. We are the victim of our own success. The increases in productivity in manufacturing have meant that it has outpaced the increase in demand and globally, employment in manufacturing will go down. Uh, markets don't manage this structural transformation on their own. The failure to manage this has contributed to inequality. Fourthly, we have a dysfunctional financial system. Much of the discussion uh, since the crisis has been focused on how to make sure that the financial sector, financial system, doesn't harm us, doesn't undertake excessive risk taking. The more fundamental problem is how to make sure that our financial system actually does what it's supposed to do. And one of the th things that it's supposed to do is to take money from where there's a surplus from savers and reallocate it to where uh, it's most productive. Some have asserted that we have a savings glut. But anybody who looks around the world and looks at the needs for infrastructure, investments in, in uh, urbanization, investments in retrofitting the global economy to the realities of climate change would realize that there are huge investment needs. The problem is our financial sector hasn't taken the savings from where there are surplus and put it to good use. It was not the best use of the global scarcity of savings to invest in shoddy homes in the middle of the Nevada desert. Um, and unfortunately, our financial system is still uh, dysfunctional. Finally, there's the problem of austerity. Uh, the private sector is uh, uh, not creating demand. That was precisely the kind of situation that Keynes said that the public sector should enter to make up for the deficiency in demand in the private sector. But unfortunately, rather than offsetting the weakness, it's amplified the weakness. A lot of discussion in Europe about austerity, but even in the United States, we've had austerity. We have some 500,000 fewer public sector employees, and if our public sector had expanded at the uh, pace of, in, uh, of the population growth, we'd have some 2 million more public sector employees. So the shortfall in the public sector is some 2.5 two million workers contributing to the weaknesses in our economy. Europe has been wedded to this notion of austerity. But austerity has never worked uh, as a basis of recovery. Uh, and it certainly uh, can't work in a situation where there's the weakness in global aggregate demand. Few countries where government cutbacks have been offset by increases in exports. Uh, but 
with Europe's trading partners also facing weaknesses, this is not likely uh, to happen. The problems of austerity in Europe have been compounded but by a flawed structure of the Eurozone. Uh, the fact uh, of the matter is that uh, institutions that were meant to uh, frameworks that were meant to increase economic efficiency have actually had the adverse effect. So when the Eurozone was created, it was realized that Europe was not an optimal currency area. It was a political initiative, but the politics weren't strong enough to create institutions that would make the Euro work. There was a diagnosis of said, well, we recognize that the countries are different, but we are going to impose convergence criteria. Uh, the belief was that low debt and deficit to GDP ratios would ensure convergence. But that analysis was fundamentally flawed, not based on economic analysis. Spain and Ireland had surpluses before the crisis. The crisis caused their deficits and their debt, not the other way around. And yet, there are those in Europe who are still focused uh, ex on, on the deficits and the debt. They believe that by imposing austerity, Europe will be brought back to prosperity. The evidence is to the contrary. Those countries that have pursued greater austerity have had lower economic growth. And because the economic growth has been lower, the, dis the, the, the reduction in the deficits has been disappointing. The lower growth has meant lower tax revenues. Higher unemployment has meant more social expenditures. So the framework that Europe uh, has adopted uh, has been, uh, has exacerbated uh, its problems. They say the problem is not with the structure of the individual countries. Of course, it, every country needs to there are room for improvement in any country. But the fundamental problem is the structure of the Eurozone itself. That brings me to the question, what can we do today? Uh, it's very clear that the, the uh, situation in, in the North Atlantic is not a good one. It's very clear that uh, the policies have not worked that the underlying problem is a lack of aggregate demand. I've tried to describe very briefly the sources of that lack of aggregate demand. And that leads very naturally to a set of prescriptions about what to do. What to do to uh, restore shared prosperity. I would begin with policies to address the inequality. The growth of inequality has weakened the economy. While that was a view that was perhaps uh, a fringe view a few years ago, th that view has now moved mainstream. We now understand not only the fact that inequality weakens economic performance, but we, are ha we have a, a better understanding of the channels through which inequality weakens economic performance don't have time to go uh, into a uh, detailed analysis of each of the channels, but in terms of the prescription, it's clear that we need policies that can address this inequality. Some of these are going to be long-run policies, but some of them can, can be affected even in the short run, like more progressive taxation. Uh, the second area, uh, oh, clearly that uh, are important, is ending the focus on austerity and beginning a focus on growth. Now, that means that we need to have more investment, investments in infrastructure, education, and technology, um, investments that can lead to a reduction in the inequality. These would stimulate the economy in the short run and provide higher growth in the long run. Question is, how do we pay for it? Well, the fact of the matter is that 
the United States can borrow at a negative real interest rate, and so could Europe if it joined together in borrowing, if there were a framework like the euro bond with negative real interest rates and very high return public investments of the kind I described, over the long run, Europe's balance sheet and America's balance sheet would be improved. Yes, our liabilities might be a little higher, but our assets would have increased even more. And that would put us in a stronger position facing the future. There are other elements in uh, a strategy. Um, one of them is to make sure our banking system goes back to doing what it's supposed to do, providing flows of funds to, say, small and medium-sized enterprises. And this comes to, uh, brings me to a focus on monetary policy. Uh, monetary policy can cause problems, played an important role in the creation of the crisis. But it's been clear, it was clear in, in Keynes, that in times like these, when the economy is very weak, monetary policy can't bring, restore prosperity. Uh, it can have a little bit of effect, but very limited effect. Uh, the, uh, and it's very clear that monetary policy has reached the limits of efficacy. Let me, as a side point, emphasize that the problem is not the zero lower bound that some economists have emphasized. The zero lower bound may have been a problem in the Great Depression, but today real interest rates are minus 2%. And I don't think anybody seriously believes that if we lower real interest rates from minus 2% to minus 4%, that would solve our problem. If one really did believe that, one could get the same effect through fiscal policy by having changed the infratemporal prices through investment and tax uh, policy, uh, through investment tax credits and, and through changing over time uh, 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 taxes, VAT taxes. But I don't think there's much discussion of this, partly because, in fact, the idea that those zero lower bound uh, is the fundamental problem is based on the same kind of flawed analysis that led to the 2008 crisis in the first place, uh, a focus on the idea that interest rates themselves were this critical variable in determining uh, aggregate demand, and that if we could only get interest rate, adjust the interest rates correctly, uh, have uh, stable, uh, low and stable inflation, the economy would perform well. And so what we have to recognize is that the low interest rates alone, while understandable as part of a monetary policy in the context of a world in which fiscal policy isn't doing its job, may actually be contributing not only to a weak uh, employment situation, but to risk going forward. When you lower the cost of capital so much, close to zero, it's natural that firms are going to substitute capital for labor. And that's why you see the anomalous situation in the United States and Europe of firms replacing low-paid, unskilled workers with machines. We've created incentives for this kind of unemployment. So it seems to me that what we have to recognize is that our reliance on monetary policy is not only ineffective, over the long term, it may actually be counterproductive. There are things that monetary policy needs to address. It needs to address the failure of, the mon of, a, of our financial system to provide finance to small and medium-sized enterprises, to new enterprises, um, necessary for a robust recovery. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the way monetary policy has been focused, it's focused just on the interest rates and our, our financial system remains uh, weak. 
the United States SME lending is well below the level that it was before the crisis. In Europe, things are much, much worse. There are many other aspects of reform in both Europe and the United States that are needed, particularly in the Eurozone. There's a need for Euro bonds or some other mechanism for joint borrowing, a need to change the uh, mandate of the ECB, the European Central Bank, away from just the focus on inflation, the idea that low and stable inflation was necessary and almost sufficient for uh, high growth has been totally discredited. Uh, and yet, uh, ECB's hands are tied. Uh, the United States has uh, now a quadruple mandate of unemployment, inflation, growth, and financial stability. And Europe's fortunes are particularly weak because it continues to have a mandate focusing on inflation. Industrial policies are important in both sides of the North Atlantic, but especially in the context of Europe where you have a fixed exchange rate and you need to have convergence. But convergence, as I said before, was not a matter of mod macro policy of deficits and debts. It's a matter of industrial policies that allow those at the bottom to catch up with those at the top. Industrial policies have a proven track record of being able to do that. Uh, they don't always work, but on average, they can be successful. And we learned a lot, great deal about how to make these policies work. But yet, some of the rules of uh, the EU uh, make it difficult for these policies uh, to be used. So these are some of the ingredients of, uh, of a, a, a kind of a strategy that can bring the North Atlantic back to prosperity. It's a strategy based on investment, investment in both the private sector and in the public sector. Before ending, I should mention one other instrument of policy. Even for those fixated on the short run, even for those fixated on myopic policy, focused on one side of the balance sheet, on the liability side of this balance sheet, there is a strategy, and that's a balanced budget expansion. If government expand, increases taxes and increases spending, it stimulates the economy. And if it designs the taxes well and the spending well, it can have large multipliers and increase long-term economic growth and reduce inequality. And yet, some countries in Europe are engaged in a balanced budget contraction. They're cutting taxes and cutting spending. No wonder some of these countries are performing so badly. So even within the constraints imposed by a flawed economic structure and a flawed policy framework, which focuses excessively on one side of the balance sheet, there is room for maneuver. And yet, some European countries have chosen a policy to exacerbate the economic downturn unnecessarily. So the bottom line, which I hope will be discussed in, in uh, the meeting tomorrow, is that there is a need for an investment-led growth. Not only investment in the public sector, but also investment in the private sector. Uh, we, that kind of a strategy can put the North Atlantic, Europe and America, uh, on the road to a new prosperity and, if well designed, a shared prosperity that will address not only the weaknesses that I've identified today, but also the longer term weaknesses, the longer term problems, which have not been addressed as we focus on the short run on the crisis. Our longer term problems of climate change, inequality, and the need for a structural transformation. I look forward to hearing the report of the discussions, and I'm so sorry that I can't be there uh, with you.